Hello, how are you doing? I'm so glad you are able to stop by and get a word for your life. I hope this word that you're about to receive is going to bless you as much as it is, has blessed me. The only thing I love more than teaching and preaching God's word is hearing people be blessed by it. So I'm so excited to deliver this word for you. Stay tuned. God has a message just for you. So let's get right on into the word. Meet me in Exodus chapter 11, verse 4 through 5. And then meet me in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, and then 5 through 6. We've got a few verses to cover, um, but we're going to um, uh, be bouncing all over uh, this plague on today. Exodus chapter 11, verse 5, <clears throat> verse 4 and 5, and then Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, and then verse 5 through 6. <clears throat> Say amen when you found it. Exodus chapter 11, verse 4. Uh, Say amen when you found it. And it reads like this. So Moses said, Thus said the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl, who is behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. Now we'll go over to chapter 12, verse 3. It says, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. Skip down to verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Verse 5 and verse 6 says, Every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Israel shall kill their lambs. I want to talk from this thought, something must die. Something must die. Throughout this series, I'm in, in case I didn't tell you, I'm in a series, part 10 of this series, uh, in this series entitled Defeating the Spirit of Pharaoh. Today is part 10 of that series. And throughout this series, one thing has been clear is that you cannot defeat Pharaoh. Wait a minute, Pastor, hold on. You just titled the whole series defeating the spirit of Pharaoh. You must be delivered from Pharaoh. You cannot defeat Pharaoh. The painful thing about deliverance is that it requires something of great value to die. In order for us to be delivered from the penalty of sin, something of great value or someone of great value had to die. In order for us to be delivered from the penalty of sin, Jesus had to die. He was the only begotten son of the father. He had to die. In order for deliverance to truly occur, in order for deliverance to truly happen, deliverance from any sin, deliverance from any habit, deliverance from any spirit, something must die. This begs a very personal question to you and I today, and that question is, what what has to die for you to be delivered from Pharaoh? What, what, what has to die in order for you to be delivered from what you're bound by? What, what, is it a relationship? Is it an, a habit? 
Is it a practice? Is it, is it, is it, is it a nature? Is it, is it a, a job? Is it an opportunity? Is it a temptation? What has to die in order for you to be completely delivered and set free? Because the truth be told, uh, we, we, the, the trouble with us is that we want to be free for free. Mm. We want to be free for free. We want to be free from a thing without it costing us anything. We we, we believe in this gospel that promises us everything that requires nothing. But the truth of the matter is, if deliverance is going to truly take place, something must die. Freedom ain't free. Somebody had to pay for it. Salvation is free to you and I, but it wasn't free to my Lord because somebody had to pay for it. Deliverance costs us something. We, 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 we want to be delivered from the bondage of Pharaoh while we keep the benefits of Pharaoh. We want to be friends with benefits with Pharaoh. Oh, look at how y'all looking at me now. We want God to deliver us from the the prison and the bondage of Pharaoh, but we don't want God to take away the privileges that come with being attached to Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we want to be friends with benefits. We don't want any real commitment, but we also like that with God. We want, we want, uh, we want to relate, we want to be with God on a friends with benefits perspective. We want we we want we want to, we want God to be our our cosmic sugar daddy that that just you know we give him a little sugar and he gives us a little provision and so what we do look at how y'all don't act like y'all do y'all really want me to define the word sugar daddy some of you have been some ah. Oh, some sugar daddies, and some of you have benefited from some sugar daddies. Preach, Pastor Jay. I'm trying as hard as I can. I ain't scared of nobody. And I want you to understand, God is not your sugar daddy. He's not your cosmic bellhop. He's not your, your genie in a bottle. He's not your make a wish and it shall come true. God said, choose ye this day whom you going to serve. God is not interested in being your genie. Your sugar daddy, you know, because you give him a little shout. He supposed to give you a little blessing. You know, because when praises go up, (laughs) blessings come down. And let me pull over right there and remind you that statement has no scriptural address. In other words, it ain't even in the Bible. That's a mess we made up to support our sugar daddy theology. Preach, Pastor Jay. I'm trying as hard as I can. God is not in, 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 in interested in investing in something that don't belong to him. Whew. I said God is not interested in investing in that which don't belong to him. We got, it. we got this thing twisted. We want God to be our sugar daddy and he's supposed to pour out all these blessings that we don't have room to receive. But we go date the devil through the week and court the enemy through the week and then we want to act like we got this weekend rendezvous with God. Oh, if you can't say amen, just say hey man. God, dog. Pull up, Pastor Jay. Please pull up, Pastor Jay. Our sermonic focus for today forces us to consider the cost of deliverance. If we're not careful, we will get lost in the penalty of the plagues and miss the price of our freedom. If we're not careful, we will get so caught up in the fact that God is attacking Pharaoh that we will neglect to see the fact that God is giving an encrypted message to us that deliverance is not free. Deliverance is not cheap, and too many of us want this cheap deliverance that costs us nothing. This price is deeply outlined in the tenth and final plague against Pharaoh and Egypt. The price is death. That's an expensive price because death means I cease to exist. Death means I cease to breathe. I have lost life. It death means it no longer is conscious. It's no longer active. 
captive. It is no longer present. And to fully understand this plague, we must understand the events that lead up to the plague. And I'm going to try to sum up chapter 11 and 12 in a couple of sentences. But ver- in, 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 because you can't understand the plague without first understanding the prerequisites of the plague. Mm -hmm. See, this plague is unique in its own right. It is separated from the other nine plagues. The other nine plagues was an act of God. They were an instruction of God. But this tenth plague stands all by itself. In chapter 11, God explains that he will hit Pharaoh with his final plague. And after that, he will be forcing you to go out. He says, look, all this while Pharaoh's been forcing you to stay here. But after I give him this plague, he's going to be begging you to leave. (laughs) All this time you've been wanting to get free. And God says, when I get this plague to Pharaoh, he's going to beg you to get away from him. He's going to beg you to be free. And one last plague, one last plague. He then instructs them to ask their Egyptian neighbors for things made of silver and gold. Now watch, I said, Lord, now why are you asking them? Ask is, he, said, he tells Israel to ask their fellow Egyptians for silver and gold. Wait a minute. Israel and Egypt don't get along? You really want me to go ask my enemy for a favor? Oh, have you ever been there where God made it where the folk you don't like? Oh, whew, you gotta, now you need them. Now, Lord, is this you? Sending me to my enemy to ask for something? And God says, just keep on because I know that y'all, there's bad blood between you now. But if you keep reading, you will discover your enemy is really not your enemy anymore. This, this was a demonstration of two things. The first thing is that Israel's street credit went up. Yeah, you know what street credit is? Street credit is, is, is uh, your credibility on the streets. So, so by now, at this 10th plague, uh, 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 Israel ain't so bad looking to Egypt <laughs> because they have been proving with all the first nine plagues that evidently their God is a whole lot more powerful <laughs> than Pharaoh's God. And so now they reverence Israel. Israel can get anything they ask for now because, because so far, so suddenly now they're popular amongst Egypt. I want you to understand God, will, he, will, he will boost your property value amongst your enemies. God will find a way to make sure that your enemies know your name. I know, you, I know before you, you, you weren't worth anything to them, but now God says, I'm going to make you have some street credibility. The second thing is that Pharaoh and the Egyptians, uh, his people, have now grown distant from each other. What trips me out is now by plague nine, by plague ten, Pharaoh and his fellow Egyptians they kind of at odds now because they done told Pharaoh, look, man, how, we done got boils. We done got flies. Our livestock has died. The locusts came and ate up our harvest. How much more you want they God to show you for we lose everything? So Pharaoh has lost <laughs> credibility with his followers. I want you to understand something very clearly that God has a way <laughs> of making the people that serve your enemy turn on your enemy. Ooh. Oh. So one thing about Pharaoh is that he, that he thinks his enemies should be your enemies. Ooh. Even if God is using them. People kill me. They think because that's their enemy that they're supposed to be my enemy. And look, just because you don't like so-and-so don't mean I got to have a problem with so-and-so. Ooh, y'all ain't met nobody like that, have you? But see, that's the problem with Pharaoh. But see, you may have a problem with sister so-and-so, but sister so-and-so ain't done nothing to me. But isn't it funny how people want to control your circle because they mismanage their circle? Ah, just because Israel is your enemy, that does not mean they my enemy. So, so, so God, after that, God sends Moses to warn Pharaoh that in his final plague, he will at midnight kill Egypt's firstborn everything. From Pharaoh to his lowest servant 
to the animals. Even the dogs firstborn going to die. Ooh. Everybody in Egypt who had children, their firstborn was going to die. That's a plague right there. I got two girls, two kids. I couldn't handle it if my oldest one. Can't handle it if either one of them, but if my, you wake up in the middle of the night, ain't Holly Collin is gone. Kennedy's gone. Michaela is gone. Mari is gone. I think that's your oldest, right? <laughs> think about it. Your, your oldest is gone. Your lineage is gone. Your, the one you would leave in charge is gone. They, they, God sends a plague to Egypt, says the first nine plagues, y'all didn't get it, but I know how to get you now. I'm going to attack your offspring. Your bloodline, your DNA, here I'm going to attack. Every, from Pharaoh to the animals, God believes in the death penalty. He believes in the death penalty. Yes, God believes in the death penalty. He died by way of the death penalty. But watch this. He's the only one authorized to execute the death penalty. Why? Because you can't take that which you did not give. You didn't have the right to determine whether I be here. You don't have the right to determine whether I leave here. God is the author of our life and death. God does all this, but once again, Israel will not be touched. God is doing this so he can show his favor on Israel's life. And so after that, Moses further explains that all of the royal officials of Pharaoh will bow down and beg them to leave. Moses then leaves with anger because of his undeserved death threat. You remember last week, Mo. Mo Remember last week when I was talking to y'all, and I was closing the mission, I was talking about, you know what, you show sure right. Remember when, when Pharaoh had told uh, Moses, the next time I see you, you're going to die. Well, this is the next time he saw him. And so Moses walked away angry because he knows there's now a death threat on him. See, back, in, back then in the Bible, they, they didn't just talk. You know, kind of like how some, how some people do now. They just all talk. They, you know, they're going to talk and say they're going to fight. They talk. They're going to they gonna shoot. They, but they ain't going to do nothing. They just all talk. But back in the Bible days, if they said they was going to kill you, they would kill you. Uh -huh. And so Moses walked away angry because he was like, I didn't deserve this death. I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. Isn't it funny how folk can be angry at you about the instructions you got from God? So he, 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 leaves, he leaves angry, he leaves frustrated, and God made Pharaoh's heart even more stubborn and still, <laughs> oh my God, as if he didn't have a reason to believe everything Moses is saying, and still he decides, no, I'm not letting y'all go. My God, Pharaoh, how long, how many times, how many plagues got to come to pass for you to, for you to finally let these folk go? And so then we get to chapter 12, and there's the Passover. Church say Passover. This is the interesting thing because in, in chapter 12, Egypt was not the only one. See, it teaches us that Egypt is not the only one that had to lose something, but Israel had to kill something too. They had to kill a lamb. And not just any lamb, but a certain type of lamb. In order for them to be free and their lives to be spared, they had to kill a lamb. God was going to kill the firstborn, but everybody had to kill a lamb. Now, wait a minute. Let me go back in the text. And I want to say, you remember where the text says even the slave girls, firstborn, would die? Well, I said, wait a minute. Why would Pharaoh have slaves? In Egypt, I thought Israel was his slaves. And so I, I searched all my commentary, I searched all my studies, and I found something very interesting that the slaves he's talking about are in Israel. Ooh, now pastor, hold up now, wait a minute, you, you don't make sense, I'll tell you what I mean. There were some people in Israel <laughs> who had not been converted <laughs> to this Yahweh God that Israel serves. And so some of them, they were, they were, they were, they were uh, walking with the Israelites, but low-key still serving Pharaoh. Ooh. Which is why he said, and the slave girls, 
firstborn going to die. See, every, this was a plague that was going to hit not just Pharaoh, but everybody that's betraying Israel in their camp. I want you to know that something about deliverance exposes all those in your camp who backbite, who, who, who mistreat you, who, who, who look like your friends, but they are really not involved in your, in your worship. They, 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 are, they are backstabbers. You know backstabbers, don't you? Backstabbers, those people that smile in your face all the time want to take your backstabbers. You know backstabbers. These are the folks that's Israelites, but they still serve in Pharaoh. And God says, don't be surprised when I take one of them out too. Because you can't be delivered without God showing you the enemies in your camp. The, 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 the planted enemies in your camp. He, 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 he tells them, he tells them in, the first, in the first few verses of chapter 12, he tells them, he gives them a fresh start. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron and in, in the land of Egypt, saying, look at verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, what we don't know is what month it was. But what we do know is God started their calendar all over again. So if they happen to be in August, according to the Egyptians, they are now in January, according to the Holy Ghost. Once, I want you to understand, here's why that's important, because God wants their calendar to be connected to their calling. God says, no longer will you be operating on the enemy's clock and the enemy's calendar. I'm going to give you a fresh start. Oh, it is amazing when God allows you to start over. Oh, sometimes God can just erase all the past and allow you to start over. God will erase the board. Yeah, I did it, but God erased it. Yeah, I was over there, but God erased it. God will let you start over. Next time somebody bring your past up to you, you tell them, yeah, that's me, but I don't live there anymore. I started a new month and a new year. He gives them a fresh start, and he instructs them, he instructs them that on the 10th day of the month to take a lamb from their father's houses. He says, he tells the men, he said, men, go to your father's house, get a lamb. One per household. The lamb has to be one year old, and with no defects. He makes this clear because he, he makes this clear because Israel had a bad habit of offering sacrifices to God that were defected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so what they would do, see when you when you make a sacrifice to God, uh, back in Bible days, you would slay a lamb. Mm -hmm. And when you would slay the lamb, some Israelites would go get the broken down lamb, you know, the, the one with three legs, one eye, you know, the, the, the bad looking lamb. And then they would slay that on the altar and say, Lord, here's my sacrifice. No wonder the Bible tells us I will not offer sacrifices to God that cost me nothing. And so God was offended by their offering. Ooh, God. I said he was offended by their offering. God is not impressed when you throw him something that you don't even want, but you expect him to receive it as a sacrifice unto him. He's worthy of an excellent worship. So he said, no, don't go get me any lamb because see what I'm doing is worth more than the lamb you don't want. Bring me the young lamb. Bring me the, 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 the lamb that has no defects. And he says, he says, on the 10th day, go find the lamb. And on the 14th day of the month, kill it at twilight. He told them what to get he told them how long to keep it. He told them when to kill it. And he said, kill it at twilight. Now, twilight is the time of day when the sun sets. It is, it is when the day shifts. It, it is when the, when the time shifts from day to night. He said, when the, when the sun sets, kill the lamb. Watch this. These are very specific instructions. He wants them to understand that what dies, he says, kill it at twilight. Because what's, what's been with you all during the day cannot spend the night with you. <sighs> when you wake up in the morning, 
things going to be different. And because they're going to be different, you're going to have to kill some things that you've been depending on. Preach, Pastor Jay. I'm trying as hard as I can. In order for you to be delivered, you're going to have to kill some things you've been depending on. Ooh, Pastor, I can't let, I can't let that go because that's been my safety net. It's been my place. They've been paying my bills. They've been doing this. And God says, if you don't kill it, then stay with them. Stop asking God to free you from stuff you don't really want to be free from. Oh, am I preaching today up in here at all? Oh, so they, 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 he tells them when to kill it. He says, kill that twilight. He tells them how to cook it and then how to eat it. He says, burn. And he says, when he tells them how to cook it and how to eat it, he says, burn the leftovers. He said, I don't want an ounce of it left nowhere. Whatever your family don't eat, burn it. Burn it. He, he, he put, he's, I said, Lord, why did you, why would you, you're not a wasteful God. Why would you have them burn the leftovers? He said, because I don't want enemies eating out of your table that don't belong to your house. Mm. What does that mean? What does that mean? Because he knew that some people have the ability to do a makeover with your leftovers. Ah. Mm. You see, some folks will, will take what you threw away and try to do something with it. <laughs> ah, what God delivered you from, they'll try to build them a new God with it and build them. So he said, no, burn the leftovers because I don't want nobody trespassing on what I'm about to do for you. So he says, burn the leftovers, burn the leftovers. He says, he says, he says put the blood of the lamb. <laughs> he says, when you, when you kill it, when you eat it, take, save the blood. He says, take the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lentils. Now, what you must understand with doorposts, in, in, in Egyptian construction, uh, when they built houses, they would build, a, uh, they would build the house around the door. They usually had one door to enter and one door to go out. And so the doorpost was a door frame. It, it had two sides and then it had a lintel across the top. And God says, take the blood and smear it on the doorpost, both posts, and then smear it on the lintel. Why? Because when you come through here, this is God's metal detector. It is, it is, it is God's way of scanning what's entering the house. And every once in a while, you ought to go to your house and take Take some oil and sling it on every side of the door and across the top. Why? So the blood can screen who coming in my house. Stop answering the door. Send the blood to the door. When, they, when the enemy shows up at your house, look at the blood and say, blood, can you get the door for me, please? Because the blood has a way of shedding everything. The blood has a way of screening everybody. The blood has a way of uncovering everybody. The blood, my God, I feel a Baptist fit coming on up in here. The blood got a way of showing everything you need to know. He says, put it on the, the post. They were, and he, then he tells them, hey Holly, then he tells them, eat quickly. He says, eat quickly and eat dressed. Because usually, you know, when you get home and you get ready to eat, if you like me, you know, that eat a lot and a little overweight, uh, I don't eat when I'm fully dressed. First thing I do when I get home is come out my clothes. <laughs> and, and truth be told, I don't even put clothes on until it's time for me to go somewhere. Because when, when I eat, I want to be lazy. Because you know what happens when you get done eating, right? You want to lay down. You know, cause some of us just fat full, and I know y'all ain't fat. I'm just saying I'm fat. And so, 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 so when you, when, but, but, but what he tells them, he says, no, no, no. He says, get dressed and eat. And he says, don't take the staff out of your hands. When they would, when they would walk around, they always had a stick in their hands. That was their defense mechanism. They didn't have guns and knives and all this. They had sticks. And so he says, when you're eating, I want you to hurry up and eat quickly. I want you to stay dressed. And I want you to keep your stick in your hand. So I'm supposed to eat with one hand and, eat and hold my stick in the other while I'm dressed. Now, has God ever fed you in some uncomfortable circumstances? And so what I want you to understand is this, is that when he tells them to do this, I said, Lord, why are you having them to do all this? He says, because I need them to be dressed for a quick departure. <sighs> ah, 
See, you can't ask God to deliver you from Pharaoh and you ain't ready to go. <laughs> oh, my God. Too many, too many of us want to go, but we ain't ready to go. And, and see, I, you ever had some, have somebody ever called you and said, hey, can you come pick me up? And you pull up and they ain't ready to go. Ooh, ah, you want to make Pastor Jay mad? Ask me for a ride, and when I get there, you ain't ready. Hold on just a minute. That might get you left, and that's why some of y'all are left in the place that you in, because when, you, when God showed up, you wasn't ready to go. And my question to you is, are you dressed for your deliverance? Are you prepared for what you prayed for? Because there's no point in praying for what you won't prepare for. So, so he says in verse, he, 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 he keeps going. He says, he says, then he says, when you put the blood on the door, he says, at midnight, I'm going to send, I'm going to come by. Some scholars say he sent the death angel. That's not true. God literally took his presence and moved through Egypt. And everywhere he did not see the blood, he struck down the firstborn. He stopped by every house in the country. And everywhere he did not see the blood of the lamb, he struck down the firstborn. He says, he says, he says, this, he says, and when you do this, he says, this is going to be a memorial for you. He says, from generations to generations, you need to keep this memorial. That's why all throughout the New Testament, you'll hear stuff like, and the, at the festival of the Passover, at the festival of unleavened bread, this is the Passover. This is what they're talking about. When the Lord passed over them because he saw the blood. I want you to understand that you're supposed to be on your way to hell, but because when he got to your house, he saw the blood. Ah. You don't even know how much was aimed at your house. But when, the, when, 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 when brokenness showed up at your house, it couldn't get in because it saw the blood. When, 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 when sickness showed up at your house, it couldn't get in because it saw the blood. When, 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 when heartbreak showed up at your house, it couldn't get in because it saw the blood. You ought to thank God for the blood. We must, all that teaches me is that we have a part to play in our own deliverance. Ask one of these women who've been married for 30 years and they'll tell you the blood still works. Ask somebody who's been broke and who's been homeless and they'll tell you the blood still works. So we get to this 10th plague. This one's my favorite, ain't Holly? I've been waiting for 10 weeks to preach this part because he, he look, at, look at chapter 12, verse 29 and 30. This is plague number 10, the death of the firstborn. Look, look, at, chap, look at chapter, oh man, I'm out of time. Golly. Uh, look at chapter 12, verse 29. I, 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 Y'all got to get this. this. This was so good to me. Look, look at verse 29. And he says, he says, at midnight... The Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. So now before, we're talking about what the Lord going to do. Now we read what he did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. Even those that went to jail in Pharaoh's house lost the firstborn. And all the firstborn of the livestock. Look at verse 30. Pharaoh rose up in the night. He and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. Let, let, let me tell y'all something. This is why God says... Vengeance is mine. Not that he don't want nobody to get revenge, but he's so much better at it than you are. Oh. So you might hit him where it stings, but God gonna hit him where it hurts. Woo, he's so, that's why you are not trying to take revenge because for all you know, the revenge God going to get is so much better than the revenge you're going to get. Stop worrying about how folk treat you. Stop worrying about cussing folk out and getting back at folk because when he does it in this text, 
Ooh, when he go get him, he go get him. Look, he, 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 he does this at midnight. He didn't, he didn't do it during the day. He did it at midnight. I, I don't know why he did it at midnight. The text does not tell us why. But I do know the Lord struck down the firstborn in everything from people to animals to jailbirds. Everybody's firstborn child died. Now, there are some scholars that will suggest that it was only the firstborn male child that died. Not true. Because the text said firstborn everything. God, you killing daughters? Hey, they were guilty by association. Which is why you ought to be careful of who you connected to. Because their punishment just might be your punishment. And so, so he, he, he says, he says, uh, he says he kills their firstborn. And then the Bible mentions, it specifically mentions, yep, even the firstborn of Pharaoh. Now, I want you to notice something. In the first ten plagues, Pharaoh was irritated. But now he's devastated. First nine plays, he was irritated. Now he's devastated. You know why? Because his son died. His firstborn. The firstborn son to a king is valuable. You know why? Because that's their lineage. That's how they continue the legacy of the kingdom. It's of royal blood. He knew that when he died, his son was next in line to continue the turmoil. But God says, not only am I going to stop Pharaoh, but I'm going to stop his future too. Oh. He says, he says, he says, he says, uh, the livestock did. And when they rose up, now watch this. When God killed them, he didn't shoot, stab, send lions, send tigers, bears. He just walked by and they did. Just walked by and they died. Just walk by, they died. Walk by, they died. It, it wasn't a noisy kill. But somehow in the middle of the night, everybody crying and woke up because their child is dead. And I said, well, how did they know they was dead? And so the Holy Ghost told me, well, it wasn't, it was, it wasn't news because God prophesied that that's what he was going to do. So if God has already, if every time Moses said God was going to do something, he did it, then how are you going to go to sleep? <laughs> In your house, knowing that my child might die. Let me stay up. And think about what happens when you get there and you touch them and they don't wake up. And then you go outside and all your oldest cows are dead. All your oldest sheep are dead. All your oldest lamb is dead. Your dog is dead. Everything, firstborn, is dead. Now you're starting to remember what God said. It was a quiet kill. And so, the, and I said, Lord, who are you attacking? He said, I'm not just attacking Pharaoh, but I'm attacking this Egyptian god, Isis. Isis is the god of protector of children. He's the protector of offspring. He's attacking the Egyptian god, Isis. And so, but, but, but look at what happened. When he, 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 God's retribution and payback is what's going on here. He affected their lineage and Pharaoh's continued reign. Egypt's firstborn had to die to free you. And your lamb had to die to save you. Something had to die. Their firstborn had to die for God to get, for, for God to get re, uh, revenge, but your lamb had to die to get you saved, to get you free. And I'm so glad that the lamb was slain. Let's ride, Blue. I'm ready to go now. I'm so glad that the lamb was slain. How somebody say, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Oh, if you don't know what the lamb is, I'll tell you. The lamb, <laughs> uh, the lamb, <laughs> you know the lamb, don't you? <laughs> the lamb uh, is born of a virgin. The lamb uh, is born in a manger. Somebody say the lamb. Do you know the lamb? They tell me the lamb is somebody special. Oh, the lamb is Mary's 
baby. The lamb, he's Hannah's grandson. Oh, the lamb, he's Joseph's stepson. Do y'all know the lamb of God? And they tell me that on Friday evening, the lamb, oh, the lamb, he died. Yes, he did. The lamb died on a Friday evening. You know, I remember in church when the preacher would remind the church folks that on Friday he died. Somebody would get excited about the fact that he died. Oh, oh, I'm so glad tonight that the lamb, he died didn't he die he died until the centurion soldier said surely this is the son of God he died until yes the earth shivered in shock he died until the moon dripped away in blood he died yes he did oh, he died didn't he die the bible says they pierced him in the side yes they did they took a crown of thorns hug it on his head and and, and he died I wonder is there anybody here can testify that he died but something happened early 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 Sunday morning he got up yes he did somebody say all power all power all power they tell me when Israel was exempt from the plague Pharaoh called Moses told him come here right now he said Pharaoh told Moses you Aaron your families your livestock and even the silver and the gold that you asked for earlier you can take your stuff and do everything you ain't got to go home but we need you to get out of here right now God said stop waiting on Pharaoh to let you go but you can be to the point where Pharaoh will get on his knees and say please 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 leave me alone won't he do it won't he do it won't God use your enemies as your footstool say yes say yes yes I said, Lord, why would you give them the silver and the gold? He tells me, because the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Stop getting mad because your enemy doing better than you. All they really doing is borrowing what God gave you. But you going to get it back. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So, all I want to tell you. So they got free, y'all. They got free. And they left. And, and I thought, I said, Lord. This got to be the end of the series because the
The whole time we've been wanting to get free. He said, yeah, we want him to get free. Then when I found out, the Lord said, no, the series ain't over. I said, why? He said, because Israel got out, but that don't mean they got free. I said, I said God, what do, you, what do you mean? What do you mean? He says, I had to deliver them from Pharaoh. But now, he said, I had to get them out of Pharaoh and out of Egypt. But now, I got to get Egypt out of them. Just because you free don't mean you delivered. Here's what I mean. If this is my bondage and this is what I'm trapped over, all God does is move it out the way. Now I'm free. But if I ain't delivered, I'll keep going back and getting behind what I've been in bondage to. But, but, but deliverance is when God move it and you keep on walking like it never existed. Deliverance. How do you know you delivered from Pharaoh? How do you know you delivered? When Pharaoh no longer matters. When you ain't up crying about Pharaoh anymore. When you don't even get mad. Who, who am I preaching to up in here today? When you don't even get mad at Pharaoh. If Pharaoh gets sick and die today, you ain't studying Pharaoh. That's how you know you delivered. Just because you free don't mean you delivered. Sorry I kept y'all so long. God bless you. God keep you. If you're watching online today, I want you to understand that Pharaoh might be bigger than you, but he ain't bigger than the blood. He ain't bigger than your God. And God don't just want you out. He wants you free. And the great thing about the blood, it's an equal opportunity blood. <laughs> the only way you're going to get into heaven is if you got the right blood type. <laughs> Your blood ain't good enough. He ain't looking for one blood. Jesus. Is. And if you don't know Jesus, you need to get to know him for yourself. Right now. Wow, I hope you enjoyed that message. I hope it was a blessing to your life. Listen, now it's time for you to put into action what you just heard. Everything that God gives us, he intends for us to use in our daily life. What's the point of hearing a great word if you're not going to use the great word? So listen, it's time for you to, if you haven't accepted Christ, do so. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Also, join a Bible-based church. We welcome you right here at the Bread House to come as you are and stay as you grow. Do you want to hear more great messages from right here at our church? Simply go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Search Bread House Fed and then click the subscribe button. And there's also a little gray bell. If you click that bell, it will give you notifications every time we add new content. I'm so glad you stopped by. God bless you. God loves you. And so do I.